It's official. Sean Diddy Combs has been denied bail once again. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Okay, so we have some breaking news for you on this emergency sidebar. Sean Diddy Combs will not be reunited with his family in time for Thanksgiving. No, the embattled rapper and music mogul who's been sitting in the Metropolitan Detention Center on federal sex crimes charges since he was arrested in September, he will be sitting there now what seems to be indefinitely. Why? Because he has just been denied bail by Judge Arun Subramanian. This is the current judge overseeing this case. This judge had not decided this issue yet. He held a hearing on this last week where both sides presented evidence and arguments back and forth for why Sean Combs should or should not be granted bail. And we just got this decision. So I'm going to go through this order by Judge Subramanian right now. It was released right on Thanksgiving Eve, right at the end of the day on Wednesday. It reads, the court has evaluated each of the factors that it must consider under the relevant law. One, nature and circumstances of the offense charged. Two, weight of the evidence against the person. Three, history and characteristics of the person. And four, nature and seriousness of the danger that would be posed by the person's release. And it also says that the court has also reviewed the information submitted by Combs and the government across all three bail hearings in this case. As you remember, Sean Combs was denied bail both by a magistrate judge and a district court judge. Judge Subramanian writes, the court finds that the government has shown by clear and convincing evidence, so that's the standard, that no condition or combination of conditions will reasonably assure the safety of the community. In support of this finding, the court provides the following reasons. Now, first, Judge Subramanian goes through the allegations in the indictment to show how serious this is. And it reads, the indictment charges Combs with serious and violent crimes. And by the way, we remember he's charged with racketeering conspiracy, sex trafficking, and transportation to engage in prostitution. Subramanian writes, it alleges that for decades, Combs abused, threatened, and coerced women and others around him to fulfill his sexual desires, protect his reputation, and conceal his conduct. To do so, Combs relied on the employees, resources, and influence of the multifaceted business empire that he led and controlled, creating a criminal enterprise whose members and associates engaged in and attempted to engage in, among other crimes, sex trafficking, forced labor, kidnapping, arson, bribery, and obstruction of justice. And it goes on further to talk about more of the allegations. Judge Subramanian writes, the government has presented direct evidence of Combs' violence. And what he cites is the 2016 videotape where Sean Combs is purportedly beating his ex-girlfriend, Cassandra Ventura, in a hotel hallway. This was published by CNN several months ago. This has been a big piece of evidence in this case. We've talked about it extensively. And remember, Cassandra Ventura is the one who initially filed that lawsuit against Sean Combs back in November of 2023, got the ball rolling with all the other lawsuits and also all the criminal charges. But he not only cites the 2016 video to show his propensity for violence, but technically text messages between Combs and victim one. Now, we believe victim one to be Cassandra Ventura. But it reads, text messages from the hours and days following the 2016 Intercontinental Hotel incident say, I have a black eye and a fat lip. You are sick for thinking it's okay to do what you've done. I still have crazy bruising. From there, Judge Subramanian also says there is evidence supporting a serious risk of witness tampering. For example, Combs initiated and had unexplained communications with Witness 1, who was subpoenaed to testify before the grand jury in June 2024, and in fact testified on July 25, 2024. Combs was represented by counsel during this time, and they have offered an explanation for some of these communications, but they could not explain them all. For instance, Combs' efforts to call and text Witness 1 even after his grand jury testimony or Combs' deleted text with this witness, that's bad, right? The idea of reaching out to a witness maybe before you knew they were a grand jury witness, that could be a problem, but really after their grand jury testimony, that's a problem. From there, Judge Subramanian says there is evidence that Combs violated Bureau of Prisons regulations during his pretrial detention to obscure his communications with third parties. We talked about this a lot, how Sean Combs was using other inmates' PAC numbers to make calls, was using a private messaging service to reach out to people, was also engaging in three-way phone calls. The allegation was he was not only breaking the rules, but he was also doing it to reach out to potential witnesses in the case, maybe to try to influence potential jurors through a social media campaign. Campaign. Now, this is interesting because Judge Subramanian writes, the court makes no determination that the content 
of Combs' communications through these channels was improper. That's interesting. And this is something that he talked about in the hearing about, is it really bad he's posting things or having people post things for him on social media? So he's saying, I'm not really going to focus on the content of the communications, but, and this is something that we talked about in our prior sidebar, it was just the flouting of the rules that was the problem. He writes, however, his willingness to skirt BOP rules in a way that would make it more difficult for his communications to be monitored is strong evidence that the court cannot be reasonably assured as to the sufficiency of any conditions of release, especially given that they occurred when Combs was seeking bail and when he knew the government's concerns about witness tampering and obstruction were front and center. Yeah really bad that he's doing this when he's already accused of obstruction and he's under the government's eye. But, and this is also interesting, you know another reason why the court was skeptical about Sean Combs being released? And, you know, Judge Subramanian at least kind of entertained what would bail look like, what would pretrial release look like. He went on a back and forth, and we'll talk about this in a minute, where Sean Combs' attorneys had said he has an apartment in New York, there will be private security. Well, here's what the court says. The court doubts the sufficiency of any conditions that place trust in Combs and individuals in his employ, like a private security detail, to follow those conditions. So, wow. So really seems swayed by the prosecution's argument that his private security team could probably be susceptible to manipulation. Now, this part is fascinating. There was a back and forth at the beginning of the hearing, and we're going to get into it in a little bit, where Judge Subramanian was asking Sean Combs' lawyers about a discrepancy. You might recall that there were materials that were photographed from Sean Combs' jail cell. And the allegation was, by the defense, was that this was a violation of his privilege, that there were materials that were photographed that were subject to attorney, client, and work product privilege. And the defense had said that there was a number of legal pads that said legal on top of them. And there was a discrepancy where the judge brought it up about whether these pads actually said legal. He writes, the court further notes that it held an emergency hearing to address the government's usage of notes on legal pads recovered from Combs Bunk. At that hearing, defense counsel advised all these legal pads say legal. Yes, yes, they're marked as legal. After the hearing, the court inquired why, in light of counsel's representation that the notes at issue were on legal pads that were clearly marked as legal, photographs taken during the sweep show no such labels. At the hearing, defense counsel admitted that it has to be the case that as of the day of the search, legal wasn't written on every legal pad and that they were not sure whether the pad presented to the court had legal on it at the time of the sweep. And Judge Subramanian writes, the circumstances of this incident and the misrepresentation made at the hearing where Combs was present bear on whether the court can be reasonably assured that any conditions it imposes will be, in, will be followed or whether through inadvertence or active subversion, they will be broken and the community's safety threatened. Almost seems like the judge is saying, defense can't trust you. And then finally, Judge Subramanian distinguishes Sean Combs' case from the Mike Jeffries case, the former Abercrombie & Fitch CEO who was just recently arrested on sex trafficking charges in New York. He's facing charges in federal court in the Eastern District of New York as opposed to the Southern District, but same thing. And the idea there was he was released on $10 million bail, very similar allegations, sex trafficking. But this is what the judge writes. In United States v. Jeffries, while the government raised danger, its principal concern with respect to defendant Mike Jeffries was flight. He had no criminal history. The alleged criminal conduct, which did not involve the kind of violence or RICO allegations made here, racketeering allegations made here, abated nearly a decade ago, and Jeffries was 80 years old. So that's how he's distinguishing that case from Combs. And so ultimately, he denied Sean Combs bail. And right now, it seems that the only other option for Sean Combs will be to try to appeal this to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. They had originally appealed it up there, but they put it on pause so they could actually go back to Judge Subramanian. But now that has been defeated for them. Now, we actually did a full breakdown of the hearing from last week where the judge considered arguments from both sides. So let's play that for you right now. This could prove to be a very interesting week in the Sean Diddy Combs legal saga. Why? Is it possible Sean Combs could be released from jail right in time for Thanksgiving? It's a possibility. You know, I would have said that seemed highly, highly, highly unlikely, but after what we saw on Friday during the most recent bail hearing in front of Judge Arun Subramanian, the current judge of Combs' criminal case, a judge, by the way, who hasn't heard this bail issue before, 
It seems a lot more probable. I'm going to explain. So Combs has been sitting in the Metropolitan Detention Center, the MDC out in Brooklyn since his arrest in September. And of course, as you know, he's facing racketeering, sex trafficking, transportation to engage in prostitution charges, namely that from 2008 to 2024, he used force, threats, coercion to cause women to engage in sexual activity, including sex acts with male sex workers. That's what's known as the freak offs that he operated a criminal enterprise that was engaged in all sorts of illicit activity and acts of violence like kidnapping and arson. Okay, we knew that. And now two previous judges, a district court judge and a magistrate judge, both previously denied Sean Combs bail, siding with the prosecution's arguments that Combs was a danger to society, given these allegations, that he was a risk of flight, given his wealth, power, and resources, that he engaged in potential obstruction by improperly contacting witnesses and victims in the case. And this, by the way, is despite the defense putting forth a very expansive bail package, $50 million bond, home confinement, no phone or internet use, 24 seven private security to monitor him, limits on who can visit him and so forth. So a very expansive bail package, one that I really haven't seen. But leading into this hearing on Friday, again, in front of Judge Arun Subramanian, who hasn't decided this issue yet because he was the most recent judge assigned to the case, Prosecutors were also armed with more, more arguments, more evidence. Why? Because as we previously discussed on Sidebar, they alleged in a letter to the court that while behind bars at the MDC, Sean Combs has been violating the Bureau of Prisons rules. Now, by the way, that in and of itself could be used to show, hey, if he can't follow the rules while he's locked up inside, what makes you think he could be trusted on the outside? But putting that to the side, not only that, prosecutors say he has been engaging in unauthorized communications, such as three-way phone calls on a monitored phone, using other inmates' phone access codes to make phone calls, and using a third-party text messaging provider. And they alleged he was doing all of this to instruct third parties to reach out to witnesses and even try to influence a potential jury pool. And by the way, influencing a potential jury pool, that's with respect to the allegation that he orchestrated a social media campaign around his birthday. You might remember this. His family released a video of them wishing him a happy birthday, good wishes while he's on the phone. He's on the other line. He's locked up, but you hear him on the other line. They're all happy. Everybody's happy. And prosecutors say the aim for that was to influence potential jurors. They have evidence to say that was his intent, that he might have said something. We'll get to that. Now, there are many, many other items for both the prosecution and defense regarding this bail issue, but the best way to go through all of this is to actually go through what was said during that hearing. Now, something I have to mention about going over this hearing, there are no cameras in the courtroom, so we couldn't see this for ourselves. In fact, there's limited electronic devices that are allowed as well. So we're basing this off of reporting from those in the courtroom about what happened. Now, the first issue that came up at this hearing on Friday wasn't even about bail but it's about what happened a few days earlier. You see, the defense had accused the prosecution of improperly taking photographs of potentially attorney, client, and work product privilege material in Sean Combs' detention unit. This was after there was a sweep for contraband at the MDC. I should say the defense claims this was actually a targeted operation at Sean Combs. The prosecutors have denied this. They've said that they didn't even take part in the search, but there was this sweep, and an investigator from the Bureau of Prisons apparently took photos of these notepads and these notepad pages from Sean Combs' unit. In the end, Judge Subramanian, after there was a hearing held, said the prosecution has to destroy 19 copies of pages of those photos, that they couldn't use evidence obtained from those photos in their bail argument. And one of the things that they wanted to say was that Combs was improperly reaching out to one witness in particular. That would be shown by one of these photograph pages. And Judge Subramanian said that he would have to resolve at a later date if there was, in fact, a privilege violation. And if there was a violation, I'm not even sure what that remedy would be. Sean Combs' defense counsel has asked for the indictment to be tossed out. Has asked for the prosecution's team from the Southern District of New York to be recused. We shall see. 
Now, as we're sorting through these legal arguments, it just shows you how important having a great lawyer is, right? So how can I say that without talking about our incredible sponsor, Morgan & Morgan? This is America's largest injury law firm, our proud sponsor. And here's the deal. If you're injured, you got to know what your legal rights are and if you can be compensated. Morgan & Morgan, they have a dedicated team of over a thousand attorneys. They have an impressive track record, like recent verdicts, $12 million in Florida, $26 million in Philadelphia. These are higher than the highest insurance offers in these cases. No upfront fee. The whole process can be done straight from your smartphone. Seeing if you have a case can be done in eight clicks or less. So if you're injured, you can easily start a claim at forthepeople.com slash LC sidebar. But back to the hearing on Friday, Judge Subramanian, he had an issue with the defense. This is how it started off. You see, the defense had argued that Sean Combs legal pads clearly had the word legal handwritten on the top of the binders you know, to indicate that this is privileged. Don't search through this. These are materials that prosecutors cannot have access to. Well, Judge Subramanian said, hmm, the legal pad that defense counsel gave to this court, an intact legal pad with legal written on the binding, but when you look at the photos of two of the intact legal pads that were taken at the time of the sweep at the MDC, there's no writing on the pad. There's no legal. So why is that? He wants to know why, meaning, was legal only written on that pad after the fact? That wouldn't look so good for Sean Combs or his lawyers. And during the hearing, one of Combs' lawyers, Mark Agnifilo, said he wasn't sure when legal was written on the pads, and he did concede that during the sweep, not all the pads said legal. Judge Subramanian reportedly asked if the pad you handed up to me, did it say legal on it on November 1st, meaning when the sweep happened? To which Agnifilo reportedly replied, I'm not sure, and that led the judge to warn the defense that moving forward, make sure all of your representations to the court are true. Not a great way to start, but that's how it started. And from there, we get into the bail analysis. And the main concern from prosecutors when talking about bail is they don't trust Sean Combs to follow the conditions of pretrial release. And they highlight, as I mentioned before, the allegations of what he was doing in the MDC. Now, Judge Subramanian pressed Assistant United States Attorney Christy Slavic, well, what do you say that you might not trust him, but trust his 24-7 private security that would monitor him on home confinement? Her response, this security team, she claims one of them is a co-conspirator of Sean Combs, that this person's phone was taken away. The other is a defense investigator in this case, and she alleged that that investigator has been contacting witnesses. In other words, this 24-7 private security team works for Sean Combs. Now, Agnifilo responded to that later in the hearing, suggesting that they are proposing an independent security team. And he also highlighted that Sean Combs would be living in significantly more restrictive conditions on home confinement than in the MDC. Judge Subramanian asked Prosecutor Slavic, you cite his wealth as an issue for pretrial release, so can he use it? That's a key point. That was made by both sides. You see, the prosecutor said it's because he has the wealth, the power, the resources to do what he wants on the outside and flout the rules that he shouldn't be granted bail. Whereas the defense has said, okay, we have to create such an expensive and expansive bail package to mitigate those perceived dangers because of his wealth. Slavic reportedly responded that they are seeking continued detention, not because of his wealth, but because of his dangerousness, his risk of flight, his obstruction. So Subramanian asked her to explain the obstruction argument further. And while she highlighted what I had mentioned before, he did ask her whether running a PR campaign from behind bars is obstruction, like the birthday message campaign. Now, according to Prosecutor Slavic, Combs allegedly said he wanted to reach the jurors and said something along the lines of, presumably on a recorded phone call while in the MDC, something along the lines of, I need only one. So that kind of looks like he is trying to impact the jury. And she claims that this is impacting the integrity of the proceedings, and this is his intent to obstruct. Now from there, Judge Subramanian gets into a really key point. This is something that he actually had advised the prosecutors to be prepared to discuss. The fact that former Abercrombie & Fitch CEO Mike Jeffries was just arrested on federal sex trafficking charges in New York, albeit the Eastern District, not the Southern District, where Combs is, 
but on the face of it, very similar allegations to Sean Combs. And guess what? Mike Jeffries was released on a $10 million bail. So Judge Subramania is essentially asking, why shouldn't Combs be released then? To which Prosecutor Slavic references the letter that the prosecution had filed with the court in anticipation of this hearing. And in that letter, they say, well, okay, yes, Jeffries is accused of paying dozens of men for travel to engage in commercial sex acts, that he used a security company to surveil and intimidate witnesses, but these are superficial similarities with Sean Combs. First, unlike Sean Combs, Mike Jeffries is not accused of committing violent acts that were separate and apart from the sex trafficking allegations, and also, he didn't use firearms. Also, they say Jeffries is not accused of racketeering like Sean Combs is. Combs, they say, is continually engaging in obstruction. Jeffries' allegations of obstruction ended in 2015. And also, Mike Jeffries is 80 years old. Sean Combs is 55. Two different dangers. Now, interestingly, Sean Combs' other lawyer, Alexandra Shapiro, she jumped in at one point during the hearing, and she actually argued to Judge Subramanian that the Jeffries case is actually worse than Sean Combs' case. Why? Because there, prosecutors are alleging an international sex trafficking business and that the victims were raped and sodomized. And she also said, Combs, guess what? He's not that young either. Now, moving on from that point, I thought that was an interesting back and forth. There was another point in the hearing I want to highlight. And this centered around, once again, the infamous 2016 videotape that was published by CNN earlier this year of Combs purportedly beating his ex-girlfriend Cassandra Ventura in a hotel hallway while he was just wearing a towel. And prosecutors have suggested that Sean Combs attacked her as she was escaping a freak-off, a clear example of sex trafficking, and again, to prove that he is a danger. Dangerousness, key factor in a bail analysis. Now, Judge Subramanian did something actually interesting. He pressed the prosecution about something the defense had brought up, that that video may not be exactly what it is because CNN may have spliced it or edited it together. Slavic responded, it was a bit puzzling that the defendant brought this up because there's really no dispute as to what actually happened during that incident. In fact, the defendant admitted to it and apologized for it in a public Instagram post. That's true. Combs apologized two days after that video was released. And she went on to say whether the video was slowed or spliced or edited by CNN, there's really no dispute about what the video shows. It shows the defendant shoving, kicking, and dragging a female victim. That is true. Actually, when Subramanian was questioning Mark Agnifilo, he asked him about these text message conversations between Combs and victim one in the case, who we believe to be Cassandra Ventura. And whereas the prosecution has highlighted the messages to show that she was a victim of physical abuse and non-consensual sex acts, Agnifilo suggested that they had more information that provides more context to the relationship and to that 2016 video. He said, it really is purely consistent with our view of this being a consensual, long-term, loving, fraught relationship that had a breakup, and the breakup wasn't because of coerced sex or forced sex even suggested that there was regrettable physical conduct going both ways in this relationship. Now, when it came to the allegations of whether Sean Combs was improperly contacting or trying to contact people, Ms. Shapiro distinguished other cases, like where a defendant told someone to lie by phone. She said that's not happening here. Plus, when it comes to posting on social media, she says, Sean Combs, her client, has a First Amendment right to speak up when there is a barrage of negative media coverage out there and defend himself. And Judge Subramanian said, well, why can't he just do that through his lawyers? In other words, why does he have to go through these other third parties to do that? Now, Shapiro reportedly responded, well, we're happy to do that, but we're lawyers. It's not really what we do. Subramanian also pressed her on the communications regarding victims or witnesses, and she denied that this was evidence of obstruction, and she assured the judge that Sean Combs will listen to his lawyers. If they tell him not to do something, he won't do it. The problem, as re-emphasized by Prosecutor Slavic, is she says he has reached out to a witness, an alleged participant in multiple freak-offs, and he allegedly ignored his lawyers when they told him not to do the social media campaign around his birthday, but he wanted to do it anyway. And also, even if it is common, as the defense suggests, for inmates to share their codes to make phone calls, 
The Bureau of Prisons Handbook prohibits this. The main idea, he doesn't follow the rules on the inside. He can't be expected to follow the rules on the outside. Now, this moves into arguably the most interesting and pivotal moment in this hearing. This is when the judge inquired as to where home confinement would exactly be. Now, Mark Agnifilo indicated that it would be in Miami, that there would be a dock but no boat. And the judge heard that and said, that's not going to work. Where in New York could he stay? So, Agnifilo responded that there is an apartment in the Upper East Side, three bedrooms. There would be two security guards in the apartment, one downstairs. No access to phone or internet except calls with his lawyers. And Combs would avoid all contact with anyone who would be a witness in this case. And I have to tell you, this could be a sign that Judge Subramanian is entertaining the idea of pretrial release and home confinement. I will say, though, Judge Subramanian also heard from pretrial services. This is the office that ensures federal criminal defendants appear in court and monitor their activities so they don't pose a danger on the outside. And the representative from pretrial services sided with the prosecution and reportedly said that we maintain the bail conditions are insufficient. However, this representative seemed to acknowledge that there aren't any cases they're aware of where private guards would be enlisted. This is unique. So, what did the judge decide? Well, he said he will make a decision promptly next week on bail, meaning this week. And he did suggest that both the prosecution and the defense submit letters to the court by Monday, today, at noon. And one of the questions is, what can Sean Combs say or not say right now? And those letters just came in. So the defense pointed to the recent case of United States versus Donald Trump when it comes to what Combs can say about his own case. Because Mr. Combs is, quote, a criminal defendant and is presumed to be innocent, he has a, quote, greater constitutional claim than other trial participants, including counsel, to criticize and speak out against the prosecution and the criminal trial process that seek to take away his liberty. Accordingly, the court should apply Trump's heightened standard when considering Mr. Combs' speech here. The defense also argued again that what Combs had to say was protected under the First Amendment, free speech. Alexandra Shapiro cited multiple court cases in her letter. The cited examples do not even remotely implicate the types of possible prejudicial speech that courts have previously considered. This is not speech about witness testimony or cooperation that imperils the availability, content, and integrity of witness testimony, nor does the speech target known or reasonably foreseeable witnesses concerning their potential participation in the criminal proceeding. Mr. Combs did not make public statements in an attempt to discredit testimony for the prosecution or make evidence available to the news media. The speech does not concern any attempt to publish court-ordered discovery. And this is not a case where the party's expression was itself obstructive. The government is essentially arguing for a standard in which the entire press community and civil plaintiffs and the government itself can wage war against Mr. Combs' reputation, but Mr. Combs can't even try to influence public opinion himself in response. That is simply not the law. And clearly she's referencing the multitude of lawsuits that he's facing. Now, the defense says that none of the examples the prosecution gave hold water and they should not be used as reasons to keep Sean Combs behind bars. So what did the prosecution have to say about the bail hearing on Friday? Well, they got straight to the point on page one of their letter. The defendant's history of obstructive conduct is part and parcel to his decades-long pattern of violence, which must be considered along with his obstructive conduct to fully assess his dangerousness under the Bail Reform Act. A holistic view of his obstructive and violent conduct, conduct that is still happening presently, makes clear that there is no way to rebut the applicable presumption of detention in this case. The bail package presented by the defendant does not come close to ensuring the safety of the community, including from the defendant's ongoing efforts to obstruct this case, nor does it adequately protect from risk of flight. For all of these reasons, the defendant's renewed application for bail must be denied. So, the fact that Judge Subramanian did not immediately deny Combs' bid for bail like the other two judges did and has entertained what home confinement would look like, it is possible he could make bail. It is possible Sean Combs could make bail. Now, to be clear, should he violate any conditions if he's actually released, he will go straight back to the MDC and probably, absent some extraordinary circumstance, he will never get another chance at bail again. So if he does get released, he most certainly better be on his best behavior. Now, 
Doesn't mean that the government won't file obstruction charges against Sean Combs and let's say a superseding indictment based on what he allegedly did in the MDC. They could still do that. Remember, the government acknowledged they are submitting evidence to a grand jury in New York right now. They could also use evidence of what they say is obstruction, not even in additional charges, but just as additional evidence in the racketeering charge that he currently faces. And if he is released and violates his bail conditions, they could also file additional charges to them. Now, what happens if Subramanian denies Sean Combs' bail? Well, it seems that Sean Combs has one final attempt to take this issue up to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, a higher appellate court. In fact, his legal team had submitted a legal brief in support of bail previously with this court, but then they asked the court to pause a decision on that while they petition Judge Subramanian first. And again, Sean Diddy Combs officially denied bail for a third time. That's all we have for you right now here on Sidebar, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And as always, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time. Thank you.